The Soviet military, like their US counterparts, had the same goals for the first underground nuclear tests. They were primarily interested in ways and means of long-range detection of underground nuclear explosions. Moreover, preparations for the first underground nuclear tests began several years before they were conducted. Preparations for the first Soviet underground nuclear explosion began in 1958. Especially for the tests were prepared in Adit, which was laid in the rock massif on the territory of Semipalatinsk test site. The Adit called B-1 was made in the low mountain massif Dijalin. The total length of the Adit was 380 meters and the explosion itself was carried out at a depth of 125 meters. After the Adit was completed, a container with a nuclear charge of about 1 kiloton was placed inside on a special cart into the blast chamber. The epicenter of the future explosion was located on the surface of the mountain directly above the nuclear explosion chamber built into the rock. For clarity, a red flag was placed on the top. In addition, scientists placed test animals at the site of the explosion. Ever since the Soviet Union pledged to stop testing nuclear weapons above ground, questionable tests have been conducted in mines and wells. In the Donbass, one was set up in an active mine, not far from residential buildings. In August 1963 the USSR, the US and Britain signed the Moscow Treaty, which banned nuclear testing in the atmosphere, in space and underwater. It was hardly a coincidence that two years later the Soviet Union began a program of underground nuclear explosions in the interests of the national economy. Research institutes of the closed cities of Arzama 16 and Chelyabinsk 70 worked on program number 7. It was a twin of the American Plowshare project and implied the use of devices up to 50,000 tons in TNT equivalent for mining, seismic sounding, excavation. Until 1988, the USSR conducted from 124, officially, to 169, allegedly, peaceful nuclear explosions. In Ukraine there were two. The first one, codenamed Fakal, was carried out in the Kharkov region in the summer of 1972. An explosion in a well at a depth of over 2 kilometers unsuccessfully tried to stop the accidental release of gas. The second one took place in Donbass, a few kilometers from Yenikivo and 60 kilometers from Donetsk. Here the experiment was staged directly in the operating Uni Komunar mine. The town of Unokomunarovsk, formerly Yunkum, Uni Komunar, is one of dozens of mining towns in Donbass. A typical industrial province that no one sees, no one knows about, where many thousands of people live the miners' routine, shifts underground, alcohol, the threat of silicosis and collapse, the hope of regression after early retirement. In June 1962 an increase in production standards and food prices provoked riots in the city of Novichurkosk in the Rostov region. During the suppression of the riot, 26 people were killed. Another seven of the alleged instigators were shot by court verdict. Millions came out of such towns. Former Ukrainian President Viktor Yanukovych once said that he, too, was born under a heap site on Yunkom. Since the early 1960s, social tensions began to rise in the Donbass. The region returned to its old method of dialogue with the authorities' strikes. The shooting in Novichurkosk sparked a wave of protests. Workers demanded better living and working conditions, but only partially succeeded. In 1978 the Donbass engineer Vladimir Klebanov led the Association of Free Trade Union of Workers in the Soviet Union, it included several dozen activists. They tried to gain recognition by the International Labour Organization, but were dispersed by the KGB. On September 16, 1979, a potentially deadly nuclear explosion went off in a mine in Yunokomunarovsk. So it was. On that day, the population of the districts adjacent to the Yunazny Komunar mine was instructed about the explosion. People were ordered to leave their homes for the day and evacuated to the nearby village of Staraya Kalania. There, the residents of Ano Komunarovsk were met by field kitchens and a cordon of soldiers from the interior ministry troops. At that time, a nuclear charge of 300 tons of TNT was detonated in the mine. The bomb was made in Arzimus 16. The device was placed in a specially created excavation between coal layers. To prevent the gaseous products of the explosion from escaping outside, the chamber was blocked with more than 6 meters thick reinforced concrete lintels. 
Within seconds of the explosion, the residents of Yunkum who had not been transported felt the underground shock. Some houses had cracks in their walls, but those were the only visible effects of the experiment. The next day, the mine continued to work, and in the morning the miners went to the pit. They worked near the center of yesterday's nuclear explosion. An illogical plan. The Unicommunar mine was not one of the big ones, producing 2,000 tons of coal per day, but it had a bad reputation as a gas mine. For 20 years, from 1959 to 1979, 235 gas and coal dust emissions occurred at the mine. In 28 cases, they resulted in miners' deaths. In the late 1970s, the Yunkum mine was considered one of the most dangerous in the Donbass. The VNIP Aprom Technology Research Institute was in charge of solving the problem. They developed a plan to reduce tension between the rock strata by detonating a small nuclear charge. The project was named Clivage Object, a reference to the term that means stratification of rocks. This ends the official backstory, the testing of new technology combined with the elimination of potential hazards during coal mining. Behind the formal logic of the engineers and physicists, there is some ambiguity in their plans. The first thing that raises doubts is the economic side of the issue. The low profitability of coal mining in the USSR could not recoup the enormous costs of developing and using small nuclear charges to eliminate gassing. Secondly, although as a result of the experiment the gassiness of the Junkum was reduced almost threefold, this method was no longer used. And yet Yunkum was not the only mine in the Donbass with such problems. Given the validity of the Moscow Treaty of 1963, Junkum with its gas emissions could have been just a cover for testing nuclear weapons. This version is supported by the fact that all documentation on Kluas was taken to Moscow shortly after the explosion and remains secret to this day. Irradiation as a legacy After the nuclear explosion, the mine continued to produce coal for another 23 years. Uncom was closed due to unprofitability in 2002. From the time of the experiment until the closure of the mine, there was an increase in mortality in the city. These facts are not necessarily related, but according to Sergei Glaskov, who was once a miner at Yunkum and then its watchman, none of those who worked in 1979 are alive. In the summer and fall of 2014, the front line passed through the town and it eventually became part of the so-called DPR. Today, the Uni Communar mine is operating in water pumping mode. No one knows what will happen if groundwater takes down the reinforced concrete cofferdams around the explosion site. Subscribe to the channel and share this video with your friends. Give it a thumbs up. Tell us interesting facts you know about the topic of this video. See you in new videos.